that was originally the idea for YouTube Shorts, but I ended up having 15 page script for it, so here we have a video. At the end of the 19th century, young Russian nobleman just joined the monastery. Several years later, he produced the work called The Great Within the Minuscule and the Antichrist. Arguably not the catchiest name selection, but the text spread through hundreds of years, through hundreds of people and multiple events. It lays the history of anti-Semitism and hate. The ideas propagated in this text reached unimaginable magnitudes. From French and Russian Revolution, to Henry Ford and Hitler, and to Kanye West's Twitter today, the great within the minuscule keeps fueling hate and anti-Semitic crimes. Welcome to the Propaganda Press. This is a pilot for the episodes which I also want to run on this channel, where I take a look at the propaganda pieces and how they move through the history. And today we're taking a look at the Protocols of the Elders of Zion. Arguably this is one of the most powerful anti-Semitic propaganda pieces that travel through the history. We will learn what the Protocols are, how they came to be, and how they spread and were reprinted over the hundreds of the years from the 20th century to today. And after all, how did the ideas from the Protocol of Elders of Zion ended up in Kanye West's Twitter in 2022. And of course, this video will contain a lot of information talking about anti-Semitism and hate crimes committed through the 20th century to today. So if it's not something for you, then feel free to skip. I will also not be looking into debunking this text, but I will link some resources below. Rather, I will be looking at the history of how this text came to be, how it turned into the propaganda and spread through the world. This is one of the first editions of The Great Within the Minuscule and the Antichrist, the work that is arguing that the, there is a Jewish supergovernment that tries to bring the Antichrist and attack the Christians. This is the first publication of the Protocols, and it belongs to Sergei Nilus, Russian nobleman and Christian figure. The Great Within the Minuscule and the Antichrist was arguably not the best name, so the name was changed to the Protocols of Elders of Zion. The text was published in the Russian Empire at the beginning of the 20th century. Among other obscure things like drinking blood, eating kids and enslaving Christians, the texts also argue that the Jews control banks, institutions, and government and press. All of the texts which follow the protocols to this day contain these elements of anti-Semitism and secret Jewish government. As a lot of other conspiracy theories, the protocols are the case of the literally forgery. This is a fictional work that is in non-fiction genre and it also claims to be the real piece of this history. In case of the protocols of elders of Zion, this text actually claims that this is a record of the meeting minutes of the secret conspiracy of the Jewish supergovernment, which like many conspiracy today is a little bit odd because when you speak about the secret meetings, then you probably don't have the meeting minutes in three volumes printed on the paper. One of the examples of the literary forgery today on the internet is the fake quotes attributed to the famous people. The Protocols of Elders of Zion, a plagiarism of the earlier French work, The Dialogues in Hell. The Dialogues in Hell were printed by the other comedian and politician and journalist Maurice Jolie, who was poking fun at the French Second Republic. In the book, Montesquieu keeps the case for the liberalism, while Machiavelli makes the case for dictatorship. And they have a dialogue. An additional level of humor is added by the fact that both of them are roasting in hell while having this dialogue. But the dialogues in hell are not anti-Semitic. So there is still a missing component of the anti-Semitism that would put a base to the Protocols of Elders of Zion in the 20th century and how we know it today. And anti-Semitism was always sort of popular in Europe. I will not go specifically into the details because it is a cause for another really long video to why everybody thinks that the Jews are a problem. I will however link resources below if you want to explore this topic. So we're going to take a little compressed speed run through the history of the French Revolution and the 20th century. So there were about five centuries of the Dark Ages in Europe that were ruled by Christian faith and very questionable politics of the Catholic Church. All that ended in Enlightenment in 17th and 18th century and it happened so that the French were actually the epicenter for the Renaissance and Enlightenment ideas. French ended up having a lot of the philosophers and thinkers that were pushing in some faithless ideas of the around earth individual freedom, scientific method, and separation of church and government. More conservative and orthodox Catholics were thinking of the Enlightenment as the path of the Antichrist. During the period of Enlightenment, the Catholic Church was losing its power with really high speed, and people were also chopping the heads off the monarchy. Times were not very stable. All that escalated to the point that in 1848, 
France had a revolution and complete separation of church and state and abolition of monarchy. That was really scary for the powerful and wealthy at the time. Worse than that, in 1818 Karl Marx was born, also a Jew by the way. So at the end of the 19th century, not only the monarchy and Christianity were under fire, but also capitalism and the industrialization. All that was brewing instability in people's minds, especially in the minds of the wealthy and powerful at the time. And as it historically goes, people would blame Jews. And more than that, there was actually the Zionism and the uprising, specifically driven by Theodor Hertz, who was trying to promote the idea of the Zionist state. Theodore didn't find any support in the Jewish community, however, because even though he had amazing hair and gorgeous beard, he didn't have a messiah, third temple or land to build it. But Theodore Hertz did have some meetings with the Jewish population, and this is the closest you can get to the actual meetings of the Zions. Before the protocols were published, a lot of the similar anti-Semitic literature was circulating in Paris and France. Alfonso Tricinal published a text that was claiming that the Jews are controlling the banks and the press. The novel Bayeritz was published in Prussia, and that work also was plagiarized by Sergio Nilos later. It outlines the meeting of the Jews in the Prague Cemetery. It is very anti-Semitic work, but it is fictional in nature, it doesn't claim to be real. Jacob Brahman published some sort of the anti-Semitic work which claimed to be anthropological research, but instead of doing actual research, rather he proposed a framework of rather than seeing Jews as an individual and isolated community, viewing them as a secret state. And the history of Jacobism was also published in the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, which predates Sergi's work by quite a bit, but actually talks about the involvement of the Jews in the Antichrist and anti-Christian sort of conspiracy. And all those texts and events in part contributed to Sergi's work. Some were plainly plagiarized, and some obviously affected his views. But also Sergi Nilis was under the effects of the downfall of the Russian Empire. In 1881, Russian Tsar was assassinated, the monarchy was losing power in Russia, and there was uprisings of Bolsheviks, communist, socialist, and anarchist movements. As the nobleman who actually hold the land and kept the peasants, Sergi Nilis's status and wealth were under attack. So at some point in the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, he got really pumped up on the French publications and French literature and produced this cumulative work of first protocols. The name The Great Within the Minuscule was shortly dropped and it was republished under the protocols. And I really like this front cover of the protocols because if you recognize it, it actually has the chariot on it and tetragrammaton, which are commonly associated with the Kabbalah and occult movements. Sergei Nilus was not alone. There was anti-Semitism on the press in the 19th century in Russia. Russian newspaper Zname was publishing anti-Semitic articles. And at this point, later publications of the protocols, which were published at the end of the 19th and beginning of the 20th century, were viewed as extremely anti-communist. They would often claim that the Jews are controlling the communists and are trying to take over the world by the means of promoting communism. And of course, for his views and his publications, which were anti-communist, Sergei Nilis was put in prison and later died in the prison in USSR. But his work continued to live on through history. So as Russians were escaping the Bolshevik Revolution into Europe, they took the copies of the protocols with them. The protocols by 1920s were printed in multiple languages and countries, including countries that have severely low Jewish populations like Japan. Though the Protocols of the Elders of Zion gained a particular traction in Germany in particular. And just as the France and Russia before, Germany after the World War I was having a hard time. Industrialists as well as the nobility were losing the power and were losing money. People were suffering severe economic disparity. Living conditions were suffering and deteriorating quickly. And like earlier in the French and Russian Revolution, the fault fell on the Jews. In 1920 and 1921, Lucien Wolf and the New York Times published published one of the first debunkings of the Protocols of Elders of Zions. Authors realized that the texts were the direct ripoff of the dialogues in hell. Actually, if you ever look at it yourself, the similarities are very drastic. Sergei didn't spend much time, you know, reworking the text. He just literally copy-pasted and added anti-Semitism. By this point, however, it was too late. One man in particular took the hold of the Protocols. And of course, I'm talking about Hitler. During the reign of the Hitler and the fascism in the Nazi Germany, there were 23 or more reprints of the Protocols of Elders of Zion. 
The Protocols were expanded and adapted for the international scene. The Protocols of the Elders of Zion and the Jewish world policy were so popular that they had to be reprinted three times on the first years of the publication. During the period of the fascist and Nazism uprising in Europe, the Protocols were taught in schools and were actually embedded in the real policies. The Protocols were treated as the historically accurate document when they were obviously not. The Protocols didn't just claim that the Jews are trying to overthrow the Christian church anymore. The Protocols were now claiming that the Jews are trying to attack capitalism, imperialism and Christianity. The text was widely embedded in the Nazis and fascist propaganda, from the Mein Kampf to the movies and cartoons that were published during the reign in the Nazi Germany. And of course, the biggest genocide of the 20th century, the solution to the Jewish question, was widely based on the ideas of this anti-Semitic work and the protocols of elders of Zion. And you would think that the death of over 6 million people and the world war is enough for us to just stop here and consider this text obviously wrong and harmful and not publish it anymore. But of course, we don't stop here. The protocols made its way over to the land of the free and went in hands of one other very powerful man. Henry Ford was the industrialist and one of the richest men of the America at the beginning of the 20th century. He was extremely progressive in his new production ideas, but the Great Depression was knocking on America's doors. And of course, in addition to that, USSR was formed and was threatening the Western and American society with its communist agenda. Henry Ford also happened to have his own newspaper and publication house. So in 1920, at about the same time that the first publications were happening in the Germany at the time, the Henry Ford published The International Jew, The World's Most Problem in the Dearborn Independent, his own publication and newspaper. From 1920 to 1927, for seven whole years, the newspaper was published anti-Semitic articles which were the copies of the Protocols of the Elders of Zion reworked for the American public. Most aggressive and interesting articles were later reprinted in the book that now carried the name The International Jew, The World's Most Problem. And I really like this copy that says Jewish jazz, modern music becomes our national music. Or this one, which reads really similar to the modern conspiracy theories and says, the protocols. The possession of these documents in Soviet Russia is punishable by immediate death. Why? In all capitals. At about the same time, different publication, Hermann Bernstein was publishing the more original version of the Protocols of Elders of Zion, and now that was a history of lie, the Protocols of the Wise Men of Zion. However, a more original version was not spreading out that well, and the international Jew pretty much replaced the original Protocols. This was, of course, because the Dearborn Independent worked specifically to adapt the text of the Protocol for the American public. So after seven years of publishing the anti-Semitic protocols, Henry Ford went to the court where he was forced to shut down his newspaper, but he claimed that he was not aware that his own newspaper was publishing anti-Semitic articles on the front page for seven years. That was, of course, a lie, but not something that money couldn't solve, so Ford was cleared by the court, but he continued to sponsor the reprints of the books in the world and in America even after he closed down the Dearborn Independent. Ford was also spreading the Dearborn Independent and anti-Semitic articles through his workforce in the idea of fighting the uprising of the communism and unionism of the labor. So aside from being the piece of the obvious anti-Semitic propaganda, the Protocols of the Elders of Zion also were one of the first cases of the industrialists fighting the unionization of their workforce. The International Jew is still available in print till today, but that was not the end and the text continued to progress through the American history. So at some point, Protocols made their way into the American Civil Rights Movement. So people of color, and specifically black people of America, were under the intense pressure for centuries. Slavery, lynching, segregation, all the laws that were repressing social mobility of the people in color in the US were taking a toll. And then you find the book, like The International Jew, that claims that there is a conspiracy and that the Jewish super government is trying to control Christians and overtake and enslave the Christians. Mix two and two together and you got the conspiracy theory that the transatlantic slave trade was actually executed by 
Jews. So the Nation of Islam, the radical black nationalist organization, published the book which was titled The Secret Relationship Between Blacks and Jews, which is a very specific rebirth of the protocols because it is specifically adapted for the African Americans of the American continent. Among other things like the international conspiracy, con control of the banks and press, now this book also claimed that such things as KKK, lynching and slavery were all orchestrated by Jews. So after the end of the Second World War and at around 1960s, the protocols of elders of Zion also grew in another idea in their text. The idea that the Jews themselves staged the Holocaust. So the conspiracy basically goes as if there are Jews who killed other Jews just so they can prove that there was no Jewish super state and everybody feels compassionate towards the Jewish population. Which in the case of adaptation for African American also means that the Jews specifically staged the Holocaust to cover up the transatlantic slave trade. So everybody pays more attention to Jews and less attention to African Americans. And this is specifically the type of the anti-Semitism that you can see in Kanye West's Twitter account, for example. So if you're ever wondering which mental hoops do you have to jump through to become a black anti-Semite, well, this is how you get there. And at this point, you might see that the protocols are getting more familiar shape. Jewish super state, control of the press, control of the state, control of the mind, anti-communist views, and stuff like that are still very much embedded in a lot of conspiracy theories of today. Protocols are still printed internationally and worldwide. And some more radical Muslim states, like Hamas, for example, still treat the protocols as the accurate historical piece. But we're not done yet. Like some shitty phoenix, in the beginning of the 21st century, the protocols were reborn into a new, slightly different type of conspiracy. So what connects Jordan Peterson, Vladimir Putin, Andrew Tate, QAnon, and Proud Boys? Culture work or cultural Marxism. The idea of the culture war, cultural Marxism, or a war against the woke culture are embedded in the conservatism of today. Not always radical, but also moderate and centrist. So in 1992, the article was published that was called The New Dark Age in Frankfurt School of Political Correctness. It was published by the Schuller think tank, which I find really repulsive every time I even have to say the think tank. Think tanks are literally like propaganda pressing machines that have nothing to do with actual think or research. So the New Dark Age proposes the conspiracy that there is a secret plan to overtake our current states. The conspiracy is to specifically overthrow the capitalistic and Anglo-Saxon way of living. Step one of the conspiracy is to replace Christianity with socialism. Step two is to overtake the family structure by the means of the feminism, LGBTQ agenda and sexual liberation. So on 22nd of July of 2011, Andrew Breivik walked into the youth camp. He shot 77 people, most of whom were youth and kids. He was kind enough to give us a detailed manifesto where he did specifically link his views to the essay The New Dark Age. In his manifesto, he also claims women, Muslims and immigrants to be undermining the state and destroying the white men. And we're gonna get to the Jews in a second. But the author of this article actually never dismissed his ideas, he just said that he hopes that somebody still finds them practical. And of course you might ask, well this is all great and interesting story, but it doesn't seem connected to the earlier anti-Semitism. But the thing is, it happens so that the Frankfurt School is actually all Jews. Frankfurt School of Thought is a group of socialist and psychological scientists that were studying in the 1920s and 30s in Germany. With the rise of the Nazi state, the Frankfurt School of Thought was distributed through the world to US, with the land some remained in Germany and couldn't escape. And when I was researching for this video, I found out that my two most favorite authors, the Hesse and Fromm, are actually part of the Frankfurt School of Thought. So the cultural Marxism and the New Dark Edge essay are not the copy of the protocols, they are something far worse. Now the same anti-Semitic agenda is dispersed and includes way more groups. The cultural Marxists are replacing the Jewish superstate, but now they don't just include Jews, they also include women, immigrants, Muslims and other groups that don't hold or can undermine the power of the capitalism and Christianity and imperialism of today. Cultural Marxism is just the blob of stuff, it doesn't have any specific definition to which groups are cultural Marxists, but this is to the benefit, because now you can include the people that you don't like into that group. 
It has been less than 100 years since the genocide of the Jews in Germany, so the population may find ideas of the open anti-Semitism really repulsive. So cultural Marxism is the perfect package and perfect wrapping for this anti-Semitic and hateful idea. The cultural Marxism is really easy to swallow for the general public. It is actually so easy that one of the main warriors against the cultural Marxism is Ben Shapiro, who is Jew himself. Though I am willing to take bets on how long it's gonna continue until the Leopard is gonna eat his face off. And this is where we are today, but I think the progression is yet not complete. There are two other interesting books that I have over here. One of them is The Case for Christian Nationalism, and the other one is The Genesis of the Political Correctness. Both are also building off the ideas of the protocols, but they are not the protocols yet. I expect the work that would combine the three ideas, one being the anti-Semitism of the protocols of elders of Zion, the other one being the cultural Marxism and culture war from the New Dark Age, and the third one being the scientific races. That would form one of the most powerful conspiracies to drive the politics of the 21st century. I do, however, hope that as a society we are able to overcome this urge to constantly hate on somebody, that we don't need to reprint the same hateful text over and over through centuries and doing the same mistakes that we did in the past. But those are just my hopes after all. And thank you for joining me today. If this video gets any traction, I will produce similar pieces in the future for sure. Making this video has been really interesting and entertaining to me and that's something that I wanted to do for quite a while, so let me know what you think. And if you're interested in further discussion of cultural Marxism, I also have the video about Jordan Peterson and 12 Rules for Life, where I tried to fix his 12 rules to make Jordan Peterson a better person. And I'll put it somewhere over here, and otherwise, see you on the next book.